hi everybody that's joining this is our instagram live q a that we run every week um this week's guest is natalie runtz um so she's oh she's on time so i'm gonna add her now um drop any questions that you have uh in the comments section um and hopefully the internet will hold up enough for a whole session hi can you hear me okay can yes yeah awesome awesome um sorry in advance if the internet drops out last week we had um, many issues but i'm really hoping that this week it's repaired itself (laughs) Um, so bear with me (laughs) um so for our followers and people tuning in do you want to just introduce who you are and what you do sure um so hello everyone uh i'm nathan france uh, and i'm for the hours of art um, my background's in both zoology and wildlife filmmaking. And um, I then had a and went on to study um, a master's in wildlife filmmaking at UE in Bristol uh, in partnership with the BBC NHU. And then I made my student film actually over on the Isles of Scilly, and it's kind of how I ended up um, working over there as, as a marine ranger for the Wildlife Trust. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. I think that was one of the questions, so <laughs> answer that already. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so for people that might not know what Love the Oceans is or what this is, um, so we are a marine conservation organisation um, based in Mozambique. So, yeah, that's why the internet can be a bit dodgy. Um, and we are working to establish a marine protected area here. So we would usually be doing a lot of different areas of research and community outreach, um, fisheries research, humpback whales, coral reefs, ocean trash, Uh, marine megafauna to community outreach projects Um, but obviously covid has meant that it's changed our activities this year quite a lot Um, so uh, Mozambique went into lockdown and we weren't allowed to launch the boat and things like that and obviously community work not allowed large gatherings of people or anything like that so we decided to create this live Q&A series to invite some cool guests on like yourself um, and chat all things conservation and yeah um be able to engage with our followers and still provide like meaningful content and things like that um even though covid has halted our normal activities um so thank you very much for joining us this evening (laughs) no thanks for having me (laughs) it's all good um so we've been sent a bunch of questions if you're cool with it we'll just jump straight in with them (laughs) i'll try my best (laughs) Okay, perfect. Um, okay, cool. So first question is about your zoology. So um, where did your love of zoology stem from? Um, I think for me, really, it's probably started quite young. Um, had a very outdoorsy childhood, even sort of despite where I grew up. So I grew up in Berkshire, where I actually am currently now uh, visiting family at the moment. Um, but we had a caravan. My mum had always been on loads of like walking and hiking holidays when she was younger, Um, And I guess kind of wanted us to have the same experience because she'd been quite lucky to explore a lot of the UK. Um, So most weekends, to be honest, I I remember growing up, we were really lucky in that we'd sort of go off to different places around um, around the UK and sort of go walking, go to the beach. So I was always kind of outdoors and in nature and just sort of fell in love with it. And then obviously, I guess, wanted to learn more of an understanding about it. Um, Yeah wildlife and animals I guess like we had loads of pets and stuff growing up I think our max at one point we had about 13 pets in the house so like we were always a bit animal what? mad <laughs> um and then I I did quite a lot of um, animal care work even from quite a young age so I think my first animal care job I was about 14 15 um so I did did that part-time just on the weekends working at um, a rare breeds farm uh, and yeah I sort of fell in love with it and wanted to follow that sort of path yeah <laughs> What species, someone just actually sent um, a question through, what species do you work with predominantly? Um, now in the role that I'm in um, with the Arzacilli Wildlife Trust, uh, mainly it's sort of seabirds and seals. Um, so Scilly is one of only two UK breeding sites for the Manx Shearwater. Um, we've got really important populations of storm petrels um, and Atlantic grey seals is like particular passion of mine because I've worked at the seal sanctuary prior to being over there and I just I absolutely love them um and the UK itself has like 40 percent of the world population and then on the islands we actually contribute to one percent of regional pupping of Atlantic grey seals so we do a lot of work around sort of seal surveying that sort of started up in the last year or so 
um, that we had some some training from the Cornwall Seal Group of how to photo ID seals so that we can try and sort of track who's where, where they're moving and hopefully potentially get um, new areas protected in the long run if they're moving out, so outside zones that are protected now, basically. Wow, that's awesome. I don't think, I'm not sure, I think I've, oh, I have seen seals from far away in South Africa, <laughs> but I've never seen them. I've actually, I don't think I've ever even seen them in the UK, which is terrible because <laughs> obviously I'm from the UK originally. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. That sounds like really cool work. Um, I'm actually going to ask you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but our second question was about like the other kind of work that you do um, with your wildlife filmmaking. Like how did you get into that? And yeah, what what does that look like for you? Um, so I did um, the master's in wildlife filmmaking was kind of where like really trying to throw myself into that started. I'd always been into photography. I did that um, when I was at secondary school um, and then did an A-level in photography and then I kind of, I guess, moved more quite literally into moving image because I loved photography. I love still, still love the power of them. And I think they're beautiful. But in terms of telling stories, especially conservation stories, there's a lot of power in sort of video and being able to convey it that way. So I wanted to learn a lot more about that. I shoot a lot of stuff that particularly that I do for the trust on my mobile phone. Um, I was very lucky at uni that I had access to all sorts of incredible camera gear was amazing like and was just very exciting to be able to experiment with all that kit but I don't unfortunately have that kind of stuff for, for me personally because it's just crazy expensive yeah I was gonna say it's nuts kind of money <laughs> the the money involved in that is yeah crazy yeah. <laughs> it really is but to be honest you don't necessarily need it so if anyone's sort of wanting to make content don't think that just because you haven't got a long lens or whatever that you you can't do it you can still make pretty amazing stuff on on your phone um so i did um sort of some work experience getting involved with um research for documentaries and stuff both sort of throughout the course um that i did at, at ue and um, they have really good links with the bbc and hu so you got to sort of go in there and get sort of workshops and seminars a lot to get a real working understanding of, sort of how the industry works um and then wow. yeah just on social media and stuff I got to do um, a story for BBC Spring Watch I think that was two years back now um, so that was good fun <laughs> yeah that's pretty cool you get to like go in and actually see how everything works and stuff as well it's yeah. quite unusual for a course right yeah definitely it's what kind of puts it above really, um, courses that, that do it I think there's actually only two in the UK anyway so they're they're both got sort of industry links but um, yeah, the one in you is the one that I really wanted to do. I didn't actually get in first time round and I went for it again because I just knew that I wanted to do that one. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went. I once went down to Falmouth campus and looked at their, uh, one of my friends was studying uh, marine and natural history uh, photography there and yeah. the kit room. <laughs> like I only saw the kit room, but the kit rooms in those places are unreal. Like I walked in and I was like, holy shit, how much... <laughs> how much money was spent in these rooms it's it's pretty incredible to to see all the like gear that students get access to but I mean obviously that's the experience that you need to get to be able to continue in the industry and know what gear you want and all the kind of all that kind of stuff and it so. develops, like changes so sometimes it's if you want a decent like amount of your own kit then that's great but you know like technology changes so much anyway that it might be outdated within yeah, now I've long, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I started with my, I do photography and um, I started with my camera, which was like great when I first got it and now it's devalued so much. Like cameras just, they <laughs> evolve so quickly. Um, so it's, yeah, technology is always changing, eh? Um, but you uh, have worked on a documentary recently called Waterborne, right? And that's about your journey. So do you want to just talk a little bit about um, what Waterborne is and how it came about and that, like, what that looks like? Yeah. Um, so Waterborne, as you're saying, is an authored short documentary um, that I made as my thesis film for my master's. Um, I guess it kind of really came about by accident. Um because of something that happened to me. So I um, got a really rare eye condition, which is an absolute mouthful to pronounce. So AK is the shortened version. The full name is <laughs> Um And it's 
a very rare condition. Um, the statistics are about 125 people in the UK a year get it, um, and 80% of the cases wow. are wearers. Um, and it comes from water. It's a waterborne parasite. It's an amoeba. Um, and contact lenses basically massively increase the risk um, of contracting it. It's a rare disease, but it is unfortunately on the rise, um, presumably, I guess, because of more people wearing contact lenses. Or, but there's a lot of work on, on awareness um, for it, which is why I made um, the film that I did. Um, so what happened with me, really, um, it took about a month to get diagnosed with my condition because it's quite rare. Um, so, and some of the outward symptoms in terms of like what you experience with pain and light sensitivity makes it pretty hard to, to diagnose because it's similar. Um, but basically, I pretty drastically and rapidly lost the sight in my left eye, um, ended up having an emergency cornea transplant. Um, but I made video diaries throughout it, I guess, because for me as well, film was kind of an outlet and I wanted to record what was happening so that I could at some point potentially share a story about it. I hadn't ever really thought I'd be able to do it for the Wildlife Filmmaking Masters. Um, but it kind of all came together because I ended up with a massive fear of the water, which I'd never had in my life. Um, always been a massive water baby, always loved swimming and the seaside and everything. But I was terrified of any form of water after, um, after AK because it was a good, really, two years of my life. So I pretty much lost um, to some extent because I was just... So light sensitive, I was stuck inside for. Um, but I wanted yeah. to make raise awareness, really, um, and I made it about overcoming my fear of the water um, to go back in um, and go back swimming again because I hadn't done that in sort of almost two years when I did it, and it just kind of all came together. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> so now you're like you've you've. I haven't actually seen the documentary. Can people watch it online? Is it available online? Yeah, so until recently, I'd actually only shown it at a screening that we had in Bristol at Cinema um, and on Facebook to sort of my friends. It was publicly available, but not sort of there to, to find unless you know about it. But I have put it on YouTube, so it's on my bio um, and just a link in my bio and you can watch it via there. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, cool. Um, so everyone should go and watch that after the live obviously not right now um, but, um, uh, yeah so um, is that like that kind of are you well there's loads of questions <laughs> I'm just I'm just ordering them in my head um, so with that like with that fear like it, did the documentary end with like you overcoming fear are you back to like being able to swim uh, in the water without that fear or is that still very much like a part of a part of you and a part of your life um i am miles better for sure um even after i went in the the first time i then didn't go in again for about another year um <laughs> but i i do now I, I quite frequently um go sea swimming um much to sort of people's shock especially living in silly um people think <laughs> pictures make it look tropical but it is a good few degrees colder than the mainland because we're 30 miles out in the north atlantic so it is baltic Ooh, yeah uh, that's so not often anyway um, that's very cold so i do but it's it's definitely different um i either like I'm, i won't wear contacts again like it's it's just not really an option or something i'd want to do um personally yeah. it's not worth the risk um but i have um prescription goggles or prescriptions snorkel mask um or if i'm just going in like shallow I'll literally like keep my head above so i'm still i'd say very conscious and aware but yeah um, but no I, I can go in now which i'm so glad for <laughs> that's good to be aware of it though i mean like i didn't i didn't actually i hadn't come across um the condition before like researching you and your story and um your background um with A ak is that like in specific water types like where do where can that be like a problem pretty much everywhere um that's oh, wow. another big issue with it like a not having heard of it full stop um but b like i definitely think there's a massive lack of understanding you kind of assume that it would be in i don't know infected water sources in like a really muddy puddle somewhere you know um but mm. it's not that at all 
Um, so normally it's quite harmless um, in terms of we drink it, we, um, the water that's got the parasite in, we shower in it, um, swim in it a lot, you know, sort of. So it is around us every day. Um, but it's just rare for it to actually cause that infection. It needs basically a break in the, the surface, which is why contact lenses are, again, such a, a risk factor for oh, it. Okay. Micro abrasions on your eye. Um, so it makes basically a scratch and then a nice, warm, squishy environment for the parasite to establish. Um, so contacts can be great, but just used carefully, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Um, and how has like, how, how has that changed your life like going forward now? Like, have you had to make adjustments or have you been able to like, after the cornea transplant stuff, have you been able to like go back to normal like, normality before? <laughs> uh like afterwards and stuff or um it's definitely changed um my life in some ways um some good ways and i guess some bad ways but i'd never sort of say i wish it hadn't happened um purely because i think it made me a whole lot more appreciative of everything of being able to go outside to work to just do li literally day-to-day -day tasks that i couldn't do without severely struggling or being in a lot of pain um mm. sort of minor adjustments in terms of like day-to-day -day life there's little like life hacks because i've i've get sort of um light in this eye the odd shape around the periphery but um they weren't able to really restore the sight because i had a lot of other complications um so i my depth perception is not great <laughs> so starting driving again was definitely interesting um but other than that it's not too bad it's little things like if i'm pouring water that can go all over the side so i just just little things like putting the kettle actually on the cup um stuff like that just tiny little things but in general the biggest change of just getting used to it was out of my hands um it was very scary because it it wasn't just like it it went it fluctuated a lot so it was a lot of um sort of getting hope at it getting a bit better where i started to see more shapes and get more light in there and then i woke up one morning for example a year after year and a half actually after it all started and um the day before i'd started to see more shapes was quite hopeful the next day it had gone completely gray um because i'd got an infection actually inside my eye. um so it was uh, very, very up and down <laughs> to say the yeah. least yeah. <laughs> get your hopes up and then they get dashed again yeah That's literally nice. um but so all like that journey and stuff is all covered in like waterborne and and people can check that out on your YouTube on your yeah. bio you said yeah it's, well so yeah it's not too long <laughs> I'm definitely gonna go check that out afterwards <laughs> um <laughs> okay cool um and then someone's asked what your role because you work with the uh Silly Wildlife Trust um what is your role with them like what does that kind of encompass what does your day-to-day -day look like um it changes loads to be honest with you so i actually only started with them part-time um last summer and i was with them two days a week i was still living on the mainland not on the island um and i was going back and forth on the ferry salonian three um and i was literally on there basically to talk and engage with people answer their questions about um the work of the trust the islands the wildlife do a bit of wildlife spotting um and then winter came along um and the boat stops so um i was then moved over to the island and was working on all sorts of different projects like um new wildlife watching leaflets things for sort of online social media um I was obviously due to be back on the boat this year, um, back in the, the summer. Um, but unfortunately, thanks to all of this, obviously that's not happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like you our, um, our events and out the majority of that has not been able to happen this year. Um, the yeah. only thing we were up like right at the end of the season um, was a weekly wildlife safari. Um, so that was pretty awesome getting to do that. Um, but yeah, a lot of the face-to-face -face stuff um, has unfortunately not happened this year so it's been a lot of filming um and a lot of editing so we've tried to do things where people say haven't been able to get across to the islands we've been trying to do things like um our wildlife wednesday um feature that we do on the trust account um which is just about the work that we're doing or what's going on with us um we do virtual walks um we started video updates things like that just to kind of get that feed of information still going and give people like their little silly fix <laughs> yeah 
it's it's quite funny doing things like that like we've tried to do a bit more like that kind of stuff here as well and it's so difficult because you're basically talking to your own face on camera <laughs> yeah um and it's like really weird to like get over that and be like people are watching <laughs> and trying to like move past just feeling like you're just talking to yourself and actually engage with the audience and stuff even doing these lives like a, the world that we're living in right now is so different to what it was pre-COVID and now everyone's just like completely fully living in the virtual world and totally okay with it. Um, and it's just so, yeah, it's so strange. Like we didn't do any of these lives before. We'd never, I don't think we'd ever even gone live on it. I don't think I even knew it was a thing that you could do before COVID. And uh, now, yeah, you just got to like, be able to show people that you're still there and especially for like conservation stuff and wildlife stuff because like the government shuts stuff down you can't actually do it like for us obviously we're in a different country as well so like trying to get people to still think about us when they can't even think about traveling um is so and for obviously silly as well like going <laughs> actually getting physically out there like all of that kind of stuff is so tricky um so kudos to you for working on that and like bringing the city wildlife trust to the forefront of everyone's mind and getting people thinking about it <laughs> um so someone actually asked what is your least and most favorite part of your job um the best bits are obviously definitely me getting out and about um i'm an outside person so yeah. i love i obviously the, the filmmaking is a massive passion for me so i love going out, learning about what the estate rangers are doing, what our sort of practical work um, is doing, what it's achieving, seeing how sort of long projects are, are coming along um, and then being able to go back and share that with people. Um, so I'll go out, say, if they're doing something. So the other day um, they were working on one of the uninhabited islands called Tian, um, doing um, some management of, of the land there to try and help some of the wildflowers come back. Um, so we've got a couple of species that are only present um, in Scilly and in the Channel Islands. So it's orange birds foot and um, dwarf pansies. Um, so they've been trying to manage the, the land there and that's an ongoing six year project. Um, and we've seen a lot of increases in other wildflowers, but not yet an increase in those two species. So it's sometimes okay. obviously to, to wait to see the fruition of their work, but you mm. have, can see the gradual increase and then we're hoping those species are then gonna um, come along as well. Um, so for me, yeah, it's definitely getting out and filming things like that, seeing um, the results of what the, the team are doing and then being able to share it with everyone who supports our work. Um, because obviously people are helping us out by showing us support on social media, by giving us donations, by becoming um, members. Um, that They want to know obviously what's going on with us. So that's definitely rewarding to be able to share that with everyone because we're not particularly easily accessible, especially at the moment, much like you guys. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to kind of like keep you in the forefront of everyone's minds. <laughs> but to balance out your like favourite part, what's your least favourite part of your job role? My least favourite part, it is definitely like some of the, the more mundane office stuff that that does have to be done. Um, I mean, no one's say that they thrive sitting there sticking labels and stamps on envelopes of stuff that has to go out, but it's stuff that has to be done. Like it's part of the bigger picture, isn't it? If you want to achieve and stuff or get information out there it's it's got to be done but no one's going to say oh yeah that's really exciting <laughs> but, but it's exciting yeah. the, the potential of whatever you're sending out can have so it's thinking of the bigger picture really <laughs> yeah i think people when they think of like marine rangers or marine biologists and wildlife workers they <laughs> think of like being out in the field all the time and you know <laughs> playing with animals but, but the reality of it is you spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen like yeah, for, for me at the moment like basically my whole job is emailing um securing sponsors and doing talks and stuff like that it's all in front of a laptop now so uh, and we don't even have the educational aspect of it in person anymore <laughs> so it's all very screen orientated nowadays um but uh yeah so i think there is a fair amount of like computer time and the admin the admin tasks that um come with every job but i feel like it's unrealistic to to expect that you will love every aspect of any job that you take like there's always going to be 
an area where you're like, eh, could probably do without that. <laughs> if anyone says that they love every single part of their job, they're lying. Like it. it... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. And I, yeah, I think that it's kind of important when because a lot of people watch these kind of Q and A stuff for career advice and stuff, and and um, I think it is really important when people are considering careers and things that they do like you're not going to love every aspect and I think going into it thinking that you will is a bit unrealistic so um being able to appreciate that there will be aspects that you'd rather do without but you do have to do anyway is is still important so yeah um okay and then um what does the next like five years or even 10 years what do, what does the future look like for you uh what's your like plans I guess like for me having had what happened to me out of the blue with with my eye it's hard to think that you can definitely plan anything and I'm not especially the type of person that says like in x year I'm going to be here doing this um you can I've definitely got goals and of certain things that I, I want to do over the course of the next five years but obviously what happened a couple of years ago showed me that things can come out of the blue that throw you onto a completely different path um but it doesn't necessarily that it's a bad thing like I'm weirdly I guess grateful for for what happened in terms of how it changed me as a person and made me happier in in general and I probably I wouldn't be where I am um now working with the the Wicked team that I do if that hadn't happened more than likely um because who knows where I would have made my film what I would have done um so yeah it's, it's a tricky one I think especially where stuff like filmmaking is concerned because you don't know what projects are going to come up I definitely know that I like to carry on doing and um, sort of presenting work and um, the filming and sharing stories and things like that. That's so my biggest passion, really. Um, I love doing um, doing that sort of stuff. And science communication is just so important, especially now where everyone's kind of claimed back their love of nature and realised the impact that we're having on it. Um, it's definitely something that I, I want to keep doing. Um, Obviously, everyone's going to have even more of a travel bug after this. Like, uh, there's so many places that I'd love to see, both UK and abroad. Um, Come to Mozambique. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would love. To. <laughs> I was looking uh, after day actually, and it does. It looks incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> I'd to, to do that, to go see a few more places and learn more about how conservation is done in different environments, um, different places around the world. And my other biggest aim that I have wanted to do since I was about probably six or seven years old is write a book. <laughs> I would love to oh, write. Nice. <laughs> I was what, a was your, what would it be on? Just zoology, like wildlife stuff? I love fiction and nonfiction. I'd be quite keen to write both. Um, when I was younger, I was um, a fiction author and I was a little nerd in that I remember in year two everyone else went out to play and I stayed in on my own to finish writing my story <laughs> so, um, I get to do quite a lot of things like blog posts and other writing and I enjoy that because I've, I've always loved that kind of creative outlet but equally yeah I would like to write um, some kind of non-fiction book about about wildlife and conservation and yeah definitely <laughs> that's pretty cool we've been considering writing a book um like a love the oceans book around there's so many different subjects that you can write on like and there's and within wildlife conservation as well there's so many different sections you could write a book on like one section alone um so it's it's difficult to choose but we we thought about writing i don't know i'm not sure we'll ever get around to it because it, it's it's one of those things where we're like we'd love to do it and then time just doesn't allow we're always time short um but i think we'd love to write because as a team around like well because the thing is is with our conservation strategy is that we're developing it so that it's we're developing a model that can be replicated um in other places so it's almost like a, a book in itself in that the like way that we're that we that we operate with a holistic approach and stuff the idea is that it can be, can be replicated so yeah i guess we 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 wanted to write like um some kind of book around like ethics and travel abroad because there's so little guidance on that around the world 
Um, there is a couple of books on like humans and how bad it is if you don't like ethically interact with humans abroad but there's very little on like wildlife abroad um because obviously it's totally down to like the destination countries laws on how animals are treated so even if it's like a pretty big breach of like animal rights in the uk it's not necessarily a breach of the animals rights in whatever country that you're talking about um so yeah we looked at like right hopefully we will at some point like at some point during covid i was like this is gonna be the time that we've got to do this like there's there's not much else going on book writing this has got to be the the creation of the year and then we ended up doing a sustainable fishing project because there's been such an increase in illegal fishing here as a result of covid and more people becoming more reliant on the environment so that kind of got bumped up the bumped up the schedule on the priority list and then the book got bumped down <laughs> back down again so i'm not sure if we'll uh, ever get around to it but yeah um writing a book would be really really cool i think it would also be like pretty satisfying right to have like your own name on like a thing that was published like a book published that you can hold be like i did this <laughs> uh, yeah. definitely a lifelong goal and someday i plan to well <laughs> Yeah, well, you've got plenty of time, so it's all good. And who knows with COVID, um, you might have more time on your hands. We'll see. <laughs> Hopefully not too much more, though. Um, okay, cool. And then uh, we had a question around, like, careers and uh, any advice that you had for people looking at going into wildlife filmmaking. But I'm going to expand that question into zoology as well. Um, if you have any kind of, like, advice for anyone looking at getting into those two industries or both. Um, I mean, for both, like, literally, like, any experience you can get. So before I did my undergrad, I did work experience at so many different types of places, even if it's not a particular field that you want to go into. I did it at a veterinary surgery. I did it at um, bird world. I did it at a farm. Um, all sorts of different, like, places, environments. So you can see different pl ways of working in different places. And just the more experience you can put to your name, the better, because it also shows a passion um mm -hmm. and even stuff that's not necessarily related so even um on my cv now i still put certain sporting achievements because it shows aspects of your character if you've been sort of that competitive or that driven to be at a certain level of something that's still a characteristic that they're going to look at because ultimately when they get into a career they're going to see that someone that they want to work with if they don't like you or don't think that you've got sort of passion or a care for it then they're not you know going to be interested in taking you on because you've got to work with these people day in day out um i'd say particularly for filmmaking networking is massive um just there is obviously like wildlife film network in particular in bristol it's about 70 percent of the the world natural history documentary goes through bristol at some point um so really if it's wildlife film you want to be in there's your place to be um 100 um and there's all sorts of facebook groups as well so i'm on quite a lot of those and a lot of but the jobs um, get advertised on there and um, there's also different groups so we have um, a filmmakers for future group um, which is on whatsapp and they've just set up a, um, a website as well so there's all of these different kind of kind of networks and it's just putting your name in everywhere really and, and getting involved and just practice loads um, I think definitely for me when I was um, starting out trying to build up a portfolio I was super self-conscious about being crap to be honest to start off with and it's cringy to watch back when you look at it and you think oh my god that's awful but ultimately if you keep a record of all of that you're going to see progress over time and no one starts out and is amazing at something so just yeah. like yeah, the more you practice it and actually throw yourself into it and learn skills from other people watching loads of stuff online whether it's instagram um or documentaries netflix stuff like that watching loads of it you pick up um so much in terms of skill um content format so yeah just diving in really <laughs> yeah practice makes perfect eh? so um getting all that experience is useful and i think across across the board like networking is a really useful tool and i think that nowadays even like virtually networking is becoming more of a thing and people are way more accessible like through instagram messaging um and you don't even really have to oh, sorry you don't even really have to like 
properly you know go and knock on their door anymore like you can just message on instagram be like hey have you got any opportunities that um i can get involved in so it's it's easier than ever to make those connections so yeah totally 100 percent agree <laughs> those are really good volunteering to do stuff because people are going to be happy to have extra help more than more often than not so <laughs> Yeah, and if you do volunteer, utilising the connections of the organisation as well. Like, I actually am amazed that we don't have more requests from our students and volunteers and people that come out here, um, because most NGOs work with a bunch of other NGOs, or at least are aware of them. So even if they don't work in a specific area, they're going to have connections with someone else that does. So um, utilising connections and just basically remembering to ask people, like, oh, I'm... I'm interested in this area. Do you know anyone that's interested or works in this area that I could talk to? And more often than not, they'll say, yeah, I know someone or I know someone that knows someone um, that can connect you. Um, so yeah, always kind of like checking in and reminding people that you exist um, <laughs> is, is useful. Um, okay, so we have some really fun quick fire questions just to whiz through. Um, but in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the comment box or in the, they've got like a, on Instagram stories now, they've got a little question box in particular. So if you want to drop questions, then feel free to drop them there. Um, but otherwise, we'll dive into the quick fire ones. Um, so for people that haven't watched this before, um, quick fire questions are just like fun questions that aren't necessarily marine related. They're just designed to help us get to know our guest a little bit better. Um, so yeah, if you're ready, should we dive in? Yep. <laughs> okay. So first one, quite easy. Uh, favorite ocean creature? Atlantic gray seal. <laughs> nice. Um, good choice. Uh, favorite day of the week? Saturday. Uh, plastic free or eco product that you can't live without? My chilies bottle. Definitely. <laughs> nice good shout yeah insulated bottles i've got my um one green one green bottles our partners and um i've got my insulated bottle as well and that is a game changer for when we're like i have to go into town to do like errands and town's like an hour and a half drive and it's busy and hot and no one likes doing it so you save up all of your tasks like your to-do list because you just don't want to do it and then you end up with a really long one and you have to go into town for like four hours and everyone and um, when you get back to the car usually your water bottle if it's not an insulated one you're you have like hot water by the time you get back to your car <laughs> so being able to take an insulated bottle and have ice water when you get back to your car that just changes your mood completely so i'm 100 percent on board with uh, insulated bottles absolute game changer um Okay, uh, favourite beach in the world? I like Bar Point on St Mary's on the island. <laughs> Never been there, but I'll check it out. <laughs> um, last song you listened to? Sun Queen by Jerry Cinnamon. <laughs> uh, dolphins or sharks? Sharks, because there's more of a perception issue there. They need our help like in that respect. <laughs> yeah, good choice, I agree. Um, favorite holiday oh um that's a hard one probably going with uni um to a research station called Sakharat in thailand um they were tracking cobras, and we went along and basically got to do um the telemetry and and track the the king cobras that they had tagged and find out about their habitat and um triangulate the the usage of the habitat because they were trying to sort of protect them and encourage the locals to protect them as well so it was yeah just loads to learn and super interesting wow that's awesome <laughs> very interesting um would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to speak to animals speak to animals i think because then you could translate it to two people and then share um all of the information that you've gained yeah yeah, it's true. Although I think there'd be a lot of apologising on the humans. Front. <laughs> be like, Sorry for screwing up the world this much. <laughs> we didn't mean to. <laughs> um, as, a super, as a superpower, teleportation or breathing underwater? Breathing underwater. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, what book would you take with you on a desert island? I am reading The Body by Bill Bryson. Probably that, because, like, there's always time to learn more stuff. And the human body is also amazing. Like, I love animals, but it's awesome. Learning more yeah. about what we live in. That's pretty cool. I haven't, I haven't read it, but I will put it on my list. <laughs> um, what's the first thing you're going to do when things get back to normal? I would like to go on a little sort of round tour of um, places in the UK, um, a wildlife um, stand-up paddleboard tour, um, go camp, Ooh. go to different SUP spots. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds very good. I did my um, stand-up paddleboard instructors in the UK in February. I actually took a video of like driving to my instructors at one point. It was snowing. It was like a snowstorm. I was like, why are we doing this qualification right now? Because <laughs> I had to get qualified for, we were running trips. We were meant to run trips this year, which obviously got cancelled. So I could have taken longer and done it in warmer months, but I <laughs> um, chose to do it in the winter. Luckily the lake didn't freeze over though, so it's all good. <laughs> um, Okay, and then the last question is, why do you love the oceans? There's loads of reasons. Um, I think, A, there's a mystery to them. Um, like, they're huge. They cover, like, 70% of the planet, but we don't really know very much about them at all. Um, like, so many species uh, in the oceans, and lack of information is pretty phenomenal. So the potential of learning um, is just massive. Um also i think the sense of freedom um well, like you don't feel more free really than when you're in the sea i don't think it's just kind of almost like an outer body experience i guess if you're just like lying floating in water it's so calming um yeah yeah and the, this paper that i read about um the blue state of mind um is so, so true if you're by the sea you're a lot calmer both because it's like visually simple and the audio is simple like it's just the waves crashing and it just it gives your mind a breather so yeah, lots of reasons. <laughs> yeah, my house here has a sea view and one of my friends had had a really stressful day and came over and then he just sat on my porch for like five minutes just gazing like hypnotised by the waves and he was like, <laughs> wow, the wave, the, the ocean is just so calming. Like you must be so chilled living here. And I was like, it helps. It really does help. Like just being able to see the ocean in that big blue space. Um, definitely. No, I live on the beach and it, it makes such a difference. I'm so much happier sort of the last couple of years living by the sea. It's just, yeah. But I think it makes I such a difference. much live in land now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Um, okay, someone has just sent through a question. I'm going to click it. Hopefully it'll come up. Uh, I'm in a wheelchair and I want to study zoology. I love manatees, but I've resigned myself that I can't see the rest of this. There we go. Why would it show me the rest of this question? Can you see the rest of this question? No, I can see a dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah. the biology. That's really annoying. Why would it show me the rest of this question? Uh, whoever submitted that question, if you want to write the last bit of that question again, that would be uh, awesome. And then we can answer that. Uh, sorry, I do not know why Instagram's just given a dot, dot, dot and literally won't let me even when I click on it. No, I can't open it either. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, like the most I can read is, I love manatees, but I've resigned myself that marine biology isn't possible. Do you know? <laughs> Which <laughs> the, the Instagram has cut off the crucial part of that question. Um, so kbrian7, if you want to submit that question again, and we will try our best to get to it uh, maybe just put it in the comments section um and then we can probably get to it there rather than in the question box uh sorry about that um someone did ask way earlier um do you work with otters at all um i have volunteered briefly with otters so at the the cornish country we had they don't have um the same ones that i worked with when i was there um they had two asian short clawed otters um, so I didn't have loads to do with them by any means, but I used to um, volunteer weekly with the animal care team. Um, I was working at the seal sanctuary, but I was on the entertainments team. Um, so I did all of the sort of the talks and the engagement because that's sort of the side that, that I've I've always done, even though I do love the animal care side as well. Um, so I had a little bit to do with them, but it, it's not particularly close contact, especially because they have very sharp teeth. 
um, <laughs> and can quite easily chop off your fingers. Um, they're also, I guess, a bit territorial, really. Um, they're obviously, their muscle is so very scent orientated. Um, so when the animal care team were going in, they'd quite often have to wear clothes that were special to the, the otter hide um, because they smelt like them and then they'd sort of be, be less bothered by their presence in there when they're sort of feeding, cleaning, anything like that. But yeah, crazy intelligent animals and definitely obviously very cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They uh, actually hold hands, don't they? When they sleep, they hold hands <laughs> so they don't drift apart. All those okay. cute things. Uh, and juggling rocks and things like that. Um, the Asian short horses uh, were like, yeah. Do, do little bits and bobs like that. We had um, certain enrichment for them, for example, that was um, like a little box that the animal care team had made with holes in and they could poke their paws in and they try and get um, pieces of um, meat and fruit or whatever out of the out of the box because it's like a, a bit of a puzzle for them because obviously um, in the wild they'd be interacting with so many like different things. So it's just to kind of try and keep them both sort of physically active but also mentally active because they are incredibly intelligent. So, yeah <laughs> yeah that's awesome um so the uh lady that submitted that question oh geez this thing's falling off sorry um the lady that submitted that question around uh being in a wheelchair and getting involved in marine biology has just said that the last section of that question was um do you know any way of making that possible do you want to answer that and then i'll i'll give my um two pence on it as well afterwards i personally i don't have a clue to be um perfectly honest but I don't, I don't think you should like. I guess rule yourself out before um, sort of investigating it it more. Um, I'm sure there must be certain ways of of making stuff possible, um, but it's definitely not sort of my field of of expertise. Um, I I don't really know much about manatees at all either. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it depends what like section of marine biology you want to be involved in. Like, there's so many different aspects even within manatees. Like, there's the lab work, there's the field work, there's the rescues, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also like the diving aspect as well. And it depends what your disability is as well, um, because diving is pretty accessible these days. Um, like, I've dived with quadriplegics. Um, it's perfectly possible. Um, I've dived with people with locked-in syndrome. So um, it really is yeah it depends who you dive with um there is the oh, what are they called i can't remember well actually i think it's the south african board but it's called like hssa i want to say which is the handicapped scuba association of south africa so hsasa um, i'm trying to remember the acronym anyway um so they are really really great at taking people out and um you can train and then become an instructor um for uh people with disabilities in diving so uh it depends if you want to scuba dive as part of your job um if it's the field biology that you're specifically interested in if it's like it, it just depends what area you're interested in and then it depends on the company that you choose to work with as well um and you know how good they are and flexible and all the rest of it so um i would definitely yeah i would agree with natalie like don't rule yourself out uh, definitely don't rule yourself out um just uh do a bit of digging um last week no the week before last we had um the real manatee man on our q a series um jamal galves and he's um a manatee specialist so you can go back and watch that and also he's a lovely dude so just send him an instagram message and i'm sure he will probably have some um thoughts on manatee research in particular and like areas you can get involved with challenges you might face um all of that kind of stuff so um i definitely reach out to him he's a lovely lovely guy so um feel free to um contact him i think his his instagram is just at the real manatee man um so yeah check that out but definitely don't uh, rule yourself out um okay cool i think that was all the questions that we had submitted um so before we wrap up is there any like upcoming projects you want to talk about or anything that you want people to look out for or watch like your documentary or anything like that obviously yeah i'm definitely going to watch waterborne um the more people that watch that the better a raising awareness type project for me anyway um I guess in terms of future projects, some of the stuff that I've got coming up, I can't really say too much about at the moment. Um, 
but stuff that's happened recently at the trust we've had um a really exciting year in that we've welcomed um steve bachel and helen glover um as ambassadors um so steve's obviously a wildlife presenter and helen's um, an olympic gold medalist um rower um and they're both um phenomenal and they've joined us in supporting our friends of silly wildlife campaign um, so you can find out more about that on um, the Alzheimer's Wildlife Trust website, um, sort of how you can get involved, how you can support us and just learn more about our work. So, yeah, definitely go and check that out. <laughs> sure. And everyone that's tuned in, you can also follow Natalie and follow Love the Oceans. I think it's your top left hand corner. You can click and uh, just click follow on both accounts and then you can keep up to date on all the activities and you can watch Natalie's documentary in the link on her bio as well um but yeah thank you so much for joining us um oh yeah just quickly for everyone that's tuned in if you missed anything we've talked about all kinds of stuff we talked about careers we talked about the waterborne documentary and we talked about zoology and wildlife filmmaking if you missed any of it and you want to rewatch it this is going to be immediately available on our igtv on our instagram page but also it will get cross posted onto our youtube later in the week so um, if you do want to watch it on YouTube, you can watch it there, as well as obviously all of our previous guests as well. So feel free to check that out. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for joining and uh, sparing the time tonight to have a good chat. And uh, if you want to come out to Mozambique when travel allows, you are more than welcome to join us. More than game for that. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Awesome. Have a great evening. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thanks. Ciao, everybody.